Um, I saw my first patient of autoimmune pancreatitis in 1999, and my um, outlook and thoughts about pancreatic disease have not been the same since then. There are lots of lessons I've learned from knowing about this disease. I, I can't possibly cover all of them, but I'll cover a few of the provocative ones here. I don't have the answers to all the questions I raised, but uh, it's interesting. So what is AIP? Uh, the consensus definition of AIP was that it's a distinct form of pancreatitis characterized clinically by frequent presentation with obstructive jaundice with or without a pancreatic mass, histologically by a lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate and fibrosis, and therapeutically by a dramatic response to steroids. When you define AIP in this manner, there are clearly two distinct subtypes. And we, we call it type 1 and type 2. Type 1 is the pancreatic manifestation of what's called the IgG4-related disease. And IgG4-RD is characterized by these few features here. It's, it, if you take a cohort of IgG4-RD, there is clearly a multi-organ involvement. And there's typical histology in the pancreas for sure, and in many other organs, there's a very similar histology. There is characteristic, but not always present, is IgG4 elevation. And there is this lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate, which is, has abundant IgG4 positive cells. And all the organs uh, in the inflammatory phase dramatically respond to steroid therapy. And while I put autoimmune pancreatitis as the center of universe of IgG4-RD, that's clearly not true. If you were a rheumatologist and you were seeing patients with sialadenitis, you would put sialadenitis at the center of the universe because you see that as the most common manifestation of the disease. I am not sure whether the indication for treatment or response to treatment or natural history will vary depending on which organ is involved, but probably that is true. What is type 2 AIP? It's actually defined by its histology so far. It, the, his, the characteristic histologic lesion is called the granulocyte epithelial lesion, or gel, which is in, within the pancreatic duct epithelium. It appears to be a pancreas-specific disorder that is not associated with serum IgG4 elevation or tissue infiltration with IgG4-positive cells. And in the, at least in the initial series, about 30% of patients have IBD. It's dropped around 15% in our series now. So this, we compared our initial experience with type 1 and type 2 here, and clearly uh, type 2 patients are significantly younger uh, than type 1 patients. And the other thing is that the other organ involvement is not seen in, in type 2. And IBD is seen in both, but more commonly in, in, type, uh, in type 2. And finally, the relapses are very uncommon in type 2 as opposed to being very common in type 1. So in my opinion, these are distinct and separate diseases. For various reasons, which I can't go into at this time, the term AIP has been used for both, and I think it's a disservice to the less common form, which is type 2. It confuses the entity. When I talk to the general ga gastroenterologist, he thinks type AIP is type 1 and is hindering the recognition of the less common disease. When the nomenclature came up, the Japanese kept pleaded with me to give it another name. I don't know what other name to give it right now, but let's call it type 2. But remember, it's a completely different disease compared to type 1. So what lessons have I learned from this? First of all, why did it go unrecognized? There were early clues. Uh, Andre Sauer is given the credit for describing, and uh, he calls it autonomous, pardon the, the French-English, but uh, he, he called it uh, an autoimmune pancreatic disease, and that was in 1961. But I was amazed to read this article in New England Journal of Medicine, which is a case report of two patients. But this is in 1963, and actually one of those patients was seen much earlier, of steroid response to pancreatic mass and, and a biliary obstruction. So there's a patient who was treated with steroids who came with obstructive jaundice and a pancreatic mass and has went away. It didn't strike a chord. It didn't lead to anything. And there is this, another paper right after that, which quotes the previous paper and describes another patient with a gamma globulin elevation and steroid response. So many of the features that we currently recognize were recognized many years earlier, but it went unrecognized for four decades more. Why? I think there was a knowledge dissemination prior to the Internet era was pretty slow. We proposed type 1 and type 2 in 2009, and within months of that, we got other people talking about type 1 and type 2. So in the Internet era, it's very easy to disseminate knowledge. It was much harder then. You can Google all these papers I said without having to go to your library, so it's, it's pretty easy. 
more importantly, the eye doesn't see what the mind doesn't know. I mean, if we went back and looked at the histology of all these patients who had resected AIP, there's only one line in the histology, chronic pancreatitis, no malignancy. And today, if you show it to the pathologist, you'll say, what do you mean chronic pancreatitis? This is AIP. So clearly, the, if the eye doesn't see it, the mind, the, the mind doesn't know it, the eye doesn't see it. There's another problem I found early on is that of cognitive dissonance. That is an incongruence among cognitions. When you see something and you think of something and you, those don't gel, you try to resolve it because you don't want that dissonance. And when you see a patient with obstructive jaundice, you think it's pancreatic cancer, any other feature like retroperitoneal fibrosis coming with that, oh, I don't know what that is, let this is pancreatic cancer. So we strive for internal consistency and therefore we block all negative, all things that we don't fit. And that led to a lack of recognition for a long time. And that makes me believe that we are suppressing many such signals and, a, and there are many other diseases waiting to be discovered. So the other common theme that has been discussed here is the neuritis, the cause of pain in chronic pancreatitis. Well, if that is the case, why is AIP painless? It's got intense inflammation, infl as, in, as inflamed as any other chronic pancreatitis you can see, but there's very little pain. And what little pain there is dramatically resolves with steroids. I have patients on fentanyl PCA with 20, 48 hours of steroids, they come off the PCA. So there is clearly a different feature here, and, and the, the, the nerve is just as inflamed as in any other chronic pancreatitis. So it obviously needs further study. I don't have the answer to this question, but if anybody wants to study pain in chronic pancreatitis, they better have AIP as controls to understand why this disease is not painful. Can pancreatic histology reveal, reveal the etiology of chronic pancreatitis? You probably know the answer now, but if you look at the gastroenterology textbook from just a decade ago, there's a statement there that you cannot discern the, the etiology of chronic pancreatitis from looking at the histology. Well, both type 1 and type 2 are exceptions, and histology is pathognomonic of the disease, and you don't need any other uh, feature to make a diagnosis other than histology. So what is the characteristic histologic feature? The that of type 1 is called lymphoplasmacytic sclerosing pancreatitis, and it has these four features, and if you have three out of the four, you have the diagnosis. There is a dense periductal lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate without duct destruction. There's diffuse fibrosis, which is very peculiar. In fact, you can make the diagnosis simply based on that fibrosis. It's called storyform fibrosis. There's a very peculiar obliterative phlebitis, which doesn't affect the neighboring artery. And of course, there are numerous IG4 positive cells. So this is a trochoid biopsy of the pancreas when we actually had a good needle to take trochoid biopsies. The company has since withdrawn the needle to the detriment of the field, I think. This is that story form fibrosis and that diffuse lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate which surrounds a small duct without destroying it, which is very important because that distinguishes it from type 2. And I give, this is another, uh, high, another view of this uh, diffuse lymphoplasmic infiltrate. Still, the, the duct is intact. And then this is that story from whirly fibrosis. And it's so peculiar that in a blinded study, this was enough to make a call of AIP in patients who had chronic pancreatitis. And finally, they have this obliterative phlebitis. In this case, the vein is still open, but when the inflammation is it gets more, and the artery is completely spared. It's unclear why this happens. And of course, there are numerous IG4 positive cells in the uh, pathology. Type 2, on the other hand, has a neutrophilic infiltrate. There's intraductal infiltrate in the lining of the duct, which is called the granulocyte epithelial lesion, which often destroys the lining and causes obliteration of the duct and there's minimal to no IG4 positive cells. And obliterative phlebitis is far less common. And this is a classic example of that ductal inflammation, epithelial inflammation, leading to damage of the, of the ductal epithelium and often to obliteration of the duct. This is another case of a very damaged epithelium with, with uh, near obliteration of the duct. So, do other forms of chronic pancreatitis have distinct histology? Have you, have you been missing the other forms because we don't know what to look for? Well, in a blind study of alcoholic chronic pancreatitis, obstructive chronic pancreatitis, type 1 and type 2, there were 10 each of these four forms of chronic pancreatitis. We mixed it up and gave it to 14 pathologists and asked them to tell them apart. They couldn't tell the others apart. AIP was clearly distinguished from the other parts, other types. Type 1 was distinguished from type 2. 
but not alcoholic from obstructive CP. So what, we don't know what to look for. As I said, the eye doesn't see what the mind doesn't know. If you know what to look for, we may be able to tell them apart. What about serum IgG4? Is it a good biomarker? I'm going to confuse you a lot in the next few slides here. Because this is the distribution of IgG4 in, in autoimmune pancreatitis as well as in other diseases. And about a quarter will have normal IgG4. A quarter will have IgG4 between one and two times the upper limit of normal. And half of them will have twice the upper limit of normal. The problem is that if you count the dots here, there are as many as the dots here. So almost in any disease you study, there is a false positive elevation of IgG4. So if you look at the sensitivity and, and positive predictive value, it's 36% for any elevation, and it's 75% for twice the upper limit of normal. We have done a larger study now of all the uh, IgG4s measured at Mayo. And there were 4,366 patients. 5% had an elevation of IgG4. Only 10% of those with an elevation had any manifestation of IgG4-RD. So the positive predictive value in the general population is very low. If you just use it in everybody who comes through the door, you're looking at a 90% chance that you're looking at a false positive. I get calls all the time, what do I do with this IgG4? Why do you measure it? Well, the patient had a headache. Well, you're gonna have a, you're gonna have a false positive. So the problem is the symptoms of IgG4-RD actually go from headache to toe pain. So you can have anything from anywhere, and, and you could measure it for any reason, you're going to end up with a false positive. So I believe that the name IgG4 disease is a misnomer. I suggested not naming the disease after a biomarker. It's never a clever idea to name a disease after a biomarker, because biomarkers are, after all, not always specific for the disease. But the reasons for doing it were very good. IgG4 elevation is the reason we recognize IgG4 disease. And almost all patients have an IgG4 positive plasma cell infiltrate. How is common to equate the disease with the biomarker? I don't know how many times I've been told a patient has IgG4 disease because they have IgG4 elevation. So that's the, it has become synonymous with the biomarker, and that is an unfortunate thing because it's, it's most likely it'll, have a, it'll be false positive. There's another common mi misunderstanding that AIP is associated with many other autoimmune disorders. I don't know how many times I get a call saying, patient has SLE and he has pancreatic disease. Is this autoimmune pancreatitis? The problem is that, so there are some very common recognized entities like retroperitoneal fibrosis. Um, you see these renal lesions which look like tumors. Often patients have nephrectomy for this. Then there is this sclerosing cholangitis-like picture or a cholangiocarcinoma-like picture. There are lots of, lots of things, orbital pseudolymphoma. The key is that all of these so-called autoimmune diseases are actually part of the spectrum of IgG4 disease. They are not independent entities which are separate from IgG4 disease. They're all part of the, they are, all the organs have the same um, problem going on with them. They all have IgG4 infiltration and so on and so forth. There are very few diseases truly associated with autoimmune pancreatitis. IBD might be one of them, but all of these are manifestations of the same disease. In fact, you can biopsy one of the other organs, which is easier to biopsy to make the diagnosis than go after the pancreas. And is the response to steroids diagnostic or AIP? It's interesting that when I first gave this talk at the APA meeting in 2005 or so, 2004, uh, all the seven people who got up to talk to me were all surgeons and who said, you know, this is difficult to diagnose. And then I went to a talk last year or a year before and a surgeon went before me and said, any surgeon who operates on this is actually doing malpractice. And I said, whoa, this is a huge change in a few years from saying you can't diagnose it so you cannot operate on it. But then I heard something in that talk which was very disturbing to me. Because the per I'll show you first what, what uh, so basically describing you what it is, is very striking and dramatic. It occurs within days, and it's nothing like any other pancreatic disease you have seen. And these are examples of steroid response. You have seen many of these pictures, I'm, I, there's no, not, no need to spend time over it, but basically it responds pretty quickly. And even the pancreatic duct can become normal after steroids, not, does not always, but can. And this ugly looking uh, peripancreatic unresectable mass has actually become very small when you gave steroids. 
But what I heard there was that it, if it responds, it must be AIP. A surgeon is saying it's very easy to diagnose AIP. Just give them steroids if it responds to AIP. Very, very dangerous stra strategy. Feeling well after steroids is very common. Everybody gains weight. They get an appetite. You tell them you have AIP. Now they start feeling well. From the diagnosis of certain deaths, now they have been told that they have a treatable disease. They all feel well. And now you pull the plug on them, they don't want it pulled. And it's very different. The surgeon doesn't want to pull the plug, and the physician, the patient doesn't want to do it. And then there is this patients who have got a false positive IgE4 in the setting of pancreatic cancer. 10% of pancreatic cancers will have an elevation in IgE4, which will respond to steroids. So the, the false positive IgE4 normalizes when you give steroids. And then you have this cancer-induced pancreatitis, which goes away spontaneously. Various reasons why steroid response is not equal to AIP. So I would be very cautious in using that as all that response to steroids is AIP is not a true statement. So what does what uh, AIP response to B-cell depletion therapy teach us? So we stumble upon this therapy by serendipity. A patient of ours developed orbital pseudolymphoma. The ophthalmologist who was treating that said, you know, whatever you, this is treated with rituximab and maybe your this patient will respond and he did respond and that we stumbled upon a, a treatment for this disease. And rituximab is an anti-CD20 antibody, initially developed and approved for treatment of follicular lymphoma. As I said, we treated our first patient in, in 2006. His disease just melted away and we felt like, uh, this is, oh, this is another drug, and it doesn't need steroids. It can, ind independent of steroids, it induces remission. So by now, we have a fair bit of experience with it, and over 90% respond, even in hard-to-treat patients. So IgE4-RD is joining a long list of autoimmune diseases that respond to steroids. It is it, to rituximab. Right now, it's approved in the United States for rheumatoid arthritis. But there are some uh, reports of uh, multiple sclerosis uh, and other autoimmune diseases which are responding to rituximab. I couldn't tell a B cell from a B cell if I met them on the road, so I don't know anything about this condition. But all I know is that it used to be called a T cell disease and it is responding to B cell ablation. I don't know enough about immunology to tell you why, but all I know is that it is a magic drug for autoimmune disease, especially the hard to treat patients. So I'm sure we'll learn a lot from, uh, from this uh, treatment as to what, uh, what it means for etiology of this disease. In summary, type 1 and type 2 AIP are unique diseases with very pathognomonic features. There are many lessons to be learned and many more to learn from uh, knowing about these diseases. And it's very gratifying to see a pancreatic disease which is actually treatable. Thank you. <laughs>